Hey Data Junkies, welcome back to another episode of Statistics with Sean Jansen. We're still in the correlations adventure, and now we're on to topic area six, where we're going to start talking about non-parametric correlations, specifically Spearman's Row and Kendall's Tau. So this is going to start in the wrap-up section of this module. We've already talked about a wide variety of statistical topics as regards to correlations, from how to calculate covariance and correlations, to plotting them, to a bunch of other stuff. So now we're going to focus on the non-parametrics and what this happens to mean. So when we're talking about non-parametric correlations, keep in mind that Pearson's correlation, or R, is a linear association between two numeric variables. The non-parametric correlations, they're still linear. We're still talking about linear relationships between variables, but we're going to modify how we calculate these relationships and how we interpret some of these calculations as well or sorry, the, these correlations. Now, at being non-parametric, they're less powerful than their parametric counterparts, so if you're doing significance testing, keep in mind that your p-values will tend to be uh, adjusting, and you're going to find significance less often. And uh, this is going to be true that we have two types, Spearman's Row and Kendall's Tau. Let's go ahead and start with Spearman's Row. Again, it's still a linear association, and it does the same thing that Pearson's R does, but instead of doing it on the exact values, it changes it to ranked data. If the data is ordinal, it's already good to go in terms of ranking. If you're doing this on numeric data, integer data, it's going to change it into ranks when it does its calculations. And the way it's going to work is we're doing a non-parametric measure on what we call the monotonic association between two numeric variables. Monotonic association. Look at the table I have below. I have two variables, x and y, and some sort of count measures between them. X goes in things like 8, 6, 11, 14, and 5. Y is 16, 14, 22, 19, and 18. Think of these as numeric values. When it changes into ranks, we switch over to the X rank and Y rank categories. And so what it does is it orders, uh, it doesn't necessarily order, but it puts into ranking order your X's and your Y values. So we have five values. They're ranked from 1 to 5 in each one. So let's go ahead and talk briefly about what does it mean to be monotonic and then go into the calculations. So with monotonic, that's a fancy word that just generally means that when x goes up in value, so does y. When y goes up in value, so does x. Uh, and vice versa for going down. When x goes down, y goes down. Uh, what it doesn't mean is that when it has a curve bending in it. If, if x goes up, y goes up, but at some point x goes down, and y goes down, like when you have these sorts of n shapes and u shapes and things like that, those are non-monotonic, okay? So is, monotonic is still talking about those linear sorts of relationships. Now let's go ahead and figure out how to do the Spearman's Row by hand. I have on the screen for you the function for Spearman's Row, and note we write Spearman's Row as r with a small s subscript. That's to denote that we're doing the correlation, but the s tells us that we're doing the Spearman's version. You can also indicate it by the Greek lowercase rho, but sometimes that tends to look a little bit too much like a p, and people might confuse that with p values, so sometimes I just prefer to use the, the r sub s version. Uh, that also makes a distinction, too, between the uh, version with the population, which gets the Greek letter, and the sample, which gets the a, the uh, Roman alphabetized leather version here. So our function is, uh, the, the formula is 1 minus 6 times the sum of the rank differences squared divided by n cubed minus n, where d is represented by the differences in ranks. So I have a small little table here. We have x rank and y rank that we're carrying over from the previous slide, and d is the differences between them. So the first pairing, we have rank 3 minus rank 2 gives us a difference of 1, and d squared, 1 squared is 1. And we'll just go right down the table to calculate out our d squareds. And so we take all of those, and then we sum that column. That is the sum of the d squareds, which adds up to 8. So when I start to cal calculate this out, in parentheses I have 8, and then it's times 6, so my numerator comes out to 48. In the denominator, I have n cubed minus n. We had five observations, so we have 5 cubed minus 5. That comes out to 120. When I calculate that out, that comes down to 0.4. When I take 1 minus 0.4, I see that I have a Spearman's row correlation of 0.6. So it's a positive, uh, moderately strong correlation of 0.6. 
Now, if I'm going to go ahead and get a p-value for this, uh, I have it again follows a t distribution. And it follows the same function that it's going to use to get Pearson's R. We're just using the Spearman's value instead. And so when I calculate this out, I plug in the 0.6 correlation that I had five observations for N. And it tells me that I have a T-score of approximately 1.3. Two degrees of freedom since I had five observations. That's N minus two to get three. I have a T-critical value of 2.35. So, uh, and that's assuming I had an alpha of 0.10. I didn't mention, but if I was to use an alpha of 0.10, I'd have a t-critical of 2.35, and my t obtained 1.3 would not be larger than my difference t-critical of 2.35. So in this case, at that alpha, I would not be statistically significant, and so I would say that there's no significance that between the, the correlated ranks there. And again, we're talking about correlations in ranks, not just correlations with Spearman's row. If I want to do this in R, the correlation method is exactly the same with COR and COR.test. However, I need to add in not just the two variables, but I have to specify method equals Spearman. Not Spearman's row, just Spearman. And it will go ahead, if I do that with core, it tells me and I verify my by hand to get the positive 0.6 correlation. And if I do the core.test of Spearman, it tells me up at the top that I'm now doing a Spearman's rank correlation. It tells me I have an S-score and a P-value of that. Uh, and don't worry about the S-score, but look at the P-value. My P-value here is 0.35, far above what I had did a moment ago with the alpha of 0.1. And it tells me at the bottom I have a row value of 0.6. How fantastic is that? So let's go ahead and change gears up to Kendall's tau. With Kendall's tau, this is going to be better than Spearman's when you've got small samples. Usually that's when we're talking about our under 30 sort of thing. Now in this case, we're not talking about if something is monotonic. We're saying that it's being measured non-parametrically based on what we call the concordance or discordance of your XY pairs. I'm going to come back to what that means in just a moment. But the tau values can vary between negative 1 and plus 1. And there's a couple versions of tau. There's what we call tau A and tau B. The difference between them is that tau B can handle when things that are ranked, but most software, like R, when you calculate tau, it's going to give you tau B. I'm going to show you the formula for tau A. It's a little more user friendly. Keep in mind, I'm not going to ever ask you to calculate your taus and even your Spearman's rows out by hand. I'm doing these functions here for you so you get a brief introduction to them so you can see why they work and have the understanding of what goes underneath. But I'll expect that you'll use R for most of these calculations here. So I'm just going to show you the general basics of how the tau works. And the formula for uh, tau I'm denoting by R sub T. And that's the uh, concordance minus discordance in the numerator divided by the concordance plus discordance in the, the denominator. Now, what is concordance and discordance? Well, first of all, it's used with ordinal ranking. That's why we're in these non-parametrics here. And it's talking about the agreement between the ranks and the disagreement between the ranks. In order for this to work, uh, one of the columns has to be in its exact order, and the other one is matching against. And we have these set by pairs. Okay, if you don't have the pairing sort of data on here, it doesn't work as well. We have three potential outcomes. You have ranks that could be tied, so that means on a given row they share the same ranking number. Uh, and then we can also have, I'm sorry, that means that you have uh, ties inside your column. I misspoke. But inside of a column, you could say that two people both shared fourth place, so they both have rank four. This is where tau B is going to come into those things. The version I'm going to show you, we're not going to have ties. We're only going to have the concordant and the discordant. Concordant means you're going to take a look at a particular ranking inside of a column, and you're going to say below that rank number, how many ranks score below that particular rank? And this is what we call a measure of agreement. The discordant, you look at a particular ranking number inside of a vector, and you say, how many ranks scored above that? And that's a measure of disagreement. I have a link here for you that's going to go into a bit more of an explanation between concordance and discordance with an example, if you'd like. So let's take an th example here and see how this works out. Calculate the Kendall's tau. So here I have, we can think of these as design candidates for a UX, UR research study. And so we have several different uh, designs that were being looked at by two different focus groups. Designs A through designs G. Each focus group ranked the different designs on their levels of preference. Focus group 1. Uh, we have them in an order from 1 to 7 for the 7 different designs. And focus group 2 also did their ranking 
And so we're going to look and see how do these ranks compare to each other. So I start by adding on two separate columns, one for C, one for D, concordance and discordance. And then I start with A. And in design A, focus group one, I'm going to say, all right, how many of these here, um, and I'm looking at the focus group two column, because focus group one column had to be in order, so we ordered it from one to seven, from the smallest number to the largest number, and then the focus group two, that's going to change up, it's ordering based on the first column for focus group one. So looking at focus group two column, look at that first ranking of two, and I'm going to look down from that two and count how many different uh, rankings are there that are larger than two. And as I look down, I've got four, six, seven, five, three. All of them are larger than two except for that one. So I put a five in that space for C. Discordance, I say, all right, take that ranking of two and count up the number of ranks that are smaller than two and enter this here. The only thing smaller than two is one, and there was one there, so it's one. Five concordant, one discordant. I'm going to go down and do this again for the second pairing here. So for design B, focus group 2 said that was their first pick. So how many observations underneath the 1? We're not counting up above it at this point. As we move down, we're only counting for those that appeared below. So how many below this value of 1 are larger than 1? Well, we have 4, 6, 7, 5, and 3. Again, 5 concordant pairs. And then how many were discordant? Well, 1 was the top rank, and so there's no uh, discordant matches, numbers that were lower than 1, below that value of 1. So I'm going to put in a 0 there. I'm going to go ahead and populate out the rest of this table using that same methodology here. So we had three concordant pairs when focus group had the rank of 4, and one discordant, and so on and so forth. I'm leaving the bottom two boxes of C and D blacked out, because you're, since you're doing these counting pairs and you're saying how many are below, by the time you get to 5, um, the only thing below is 3, and then there's nothing below 3. So you're not going to have a C and D entry for the very last ranking pair on there. So once I have those, then I can go ahead and start calculating the tau value. So C, that's going to be the sum of all of the concordance, and D is going to be the sum of all of the discordance. So 5 plus 5 plus 3 plus 1, that comes out to 14. So 14 is my value for C. 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 is 7, so 7 is my value for D. 14 minus 7 in the numerator is 7, 14 plus 7 in the denominator is 21. Divide that out, I have a tau value of a point, about 0.33. So I have a tau of 0.33. If I want to go ahead and get statistical significance testing on this, then I'm going to go ahead and calculate out, this has a different formula for this. You do not have to remember the formulas for the p-values for both Spearman's row and Kendall's tau. These are here for illustrative purposes, so you can see how these things work out, and that we can do significance testing on them. Tau follows a z distribution, where rho followed a t distribution. We have a more complicated formula here. It's not a tough formula, but it's got more moving parts. And we enter in the tau value and the n, and it's going to calculate out, do we get a z-score of approximately 0 0.169, which is a rather small z. And so it's not going to be significant at most levels of alpha that we would have. Now when I want to replicate Kendall's tau in R, we do the core function like we did for beforehand, but in this case we specify the method equals to Kendall, not Kendall's, just Kendall. And when we do that, we get 3.33333 repeating, which matches our calculations by hand. When I do the core.test, I'm putting in my x and y, and I'm specifying method method equals Kendall there. At the bottom it says I have a tau equal to 0.3 repeating, and I have a p-value of 0.38. So don't worry about the, the t statistic, or the t rather, t equals 14. Don't worry about that. Just pay attention to the p-value and the tau down below. And so now I have these calculated by hand and in R. You just have to worry about the version in R. The other ones were just to help you through this. Now keep in mind, when we're comparing Spearman's row and Kendall's tau, they're measuring different things. Spearman's row is measuring the uh, associations between the rank differences, so it's just like Spearman's, I'm sorry, Pearson's R, but it's doing it in by rank versions. Kendall's tau is looking at the proportions of agreement versus the proportions of disagreement, C and D, concordance and discordance. Okay, so which one's going to be more intuitive to you? We can debate that based on 
how you happen to think, but they do measure different things. Now, Spearman's row tends to be used more often than Kendall's tau, and it tends to have larger values than Kendall's tau. Uh, whether it's appropriate that it should be more used more frequently, we'll leave that to the statisticians to debate. But Spearman's row can detect extreme rank deviations more frequently and easier than Kendall's tau, which is both a pro and a con. If you've got stronger differences, that's going to flag faster on Spearman's row than Kendall's tau. And the tau values tend to be more accurate to the population when you have small sample sizes. Uh, so with that, we can also just let, end this up on talking about non-parametric correlations as effect sizes. With Spearman's row, we can square row just like you squared r. When you squared r, you got r squared. When you square row, you get row squared. And by squaring row, that tells us the proportion, purport, the proportion of variation in ranks that the two variables share. And it's a good approximation for r squared. Uh, just the non-parametric version. Tau takes a different track. It is not numerically similar to, to either r or rho, and so as such, we cannot square it. It does not tell you the proportion of variation. Technically, mathematically, you can square tau, but it just doesn't mean anything, so don't do it. All right? If you want to use tau as an effect size, just treat it as the uh, measure of association, just like you would r and rho, by itself. Don't square tau, isn't it? Uh, but you can square r squared and rho squared. And with that, that's going to close up our section on nonparametrics for the conceptual. I'm going to give you a couple examples in our last video section on correlations. With that, I'll see you then.